I want to talk to you today about when free men stand. Psalm chapter 33 verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Father, we thank you today for your love and grace. Thank you for the way that you move in our life. Thank you for your word. Be our preacher and our teacher today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> One of the greatest, if not the greatest blessing that we who live in America enjoy is the fact that we're free. Does it sound like I'm in a barrel to you? Okay, I'm just checking. It's because I didn't quite crawl out of it when I got up here. Although we place a great value, <laughs> a great value on our freedom, many have a hard time defining what freedom actually is. Our American freedom is much, much more than just getting to choose what we want to do. It's more than just having the right to march on a street, to burn our flags, to burn our buildings, to shoot our officials, to rebel against our government. Our freedom is much, much, much more than that and much deeper than that. You see, our American freedoms were not actually born in Philadelphia on July the 4th in 1776. Our freedoms date back to England, as you saw in our Declaration of Independence. They were, uh, the, their roots were deep in, in Western Europe. They can actually be traced back further than that to Rome, and then across the Mediterranean to Athens, and from Athens up the Mediterranean sea coast to Jerusalem, and then southward to the Sinai Peninsula, and then to Mount Sinai itself. You see, but there was a new kind of freedom that was born in Philadelphia on July the 4th, 1776. And that was the date when our Declaration of Independence was actually issued. And from the Declaration of Independence to the Independence lay a long, blood-stained journey. The interval was marked by war, by wounds, by agony, by death, by prison, and destitution. The Declaration of Independence is based on an unchanging premise. The principle written so clearly in our original American document is that every human being deserves his inalienable rights from the owner and operator of this universe, Almighty God, was revealed himself in Jesus Christ. This thread runs through our history in an unmistakable fashion from then until today. This foundational premise is as valid today because God is who he is and we are who we are. The purpose of a government under God is to guarantee and to protect the rights of individuals. And that's you and that's me. The promise in Job chapter 12 verse 23 says, He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. In ancient history, Pericles built a civilization on culture, and that civilization failed. Caesar built a civilization on military, and that civilization failed. Our forefathers founded a civilization on faith in God, and our nation will survive as long as it honors the God who is central in our history and central in our documents. Our forefathers established this nation on that one unalterable belief that God is God and there is none like him. 
The Declaration of Independence exalts faith in God and the dignity of man. The very brief document contains only 1,321 words. The average reader can read it in about eight minutes, as you have just heard. In the text of the Declaration of Independence, God is mentioned twice at the beginning, and his name is found twice toward the ending. Faith in God was the foundation of that document. Faith in God launched this nation on her illustrious career. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you today, our faith in God will continue to cause this nation to be the nation that God has established it to be. In the pages of the Old Testament, we find an outstanding characteristics of the prophets of God. One of the characteristics is that these prophets continually call people to a recognition of their heritage. Prophetic preaching was simply a reminder to them of who they were as seen in Isaiah chapter 51 verse 1. Isaiah said, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and the hole of the pit from which you were dug. In that spirit, I come today simply to remind you from where we have grown as a nation called the United States of America. Thomas Paine said, if there be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. America and Americans in every area of our history have shared Paine's sentiment. They might have suffered through a civil war, an economic depression, or a world war. But the people of this nation still have hoped that our next generations would be better off than our own. If we want our children to live in peace, then I'm convinced that you and I must make some hard choices. Our freedom, our way of life, and our future are in peril. And not just from hostile enemies abroad. During the 20th century, we stood against the aggression of Nazi Germany and the Communist Soviet Union. Today, we are in contention with militant Islamists who see the United States as the great Satan. But they will never defeat us without help from a more dangerous enemy within. A government that leads a people who follow down a path from the Lord of glory. We need to be aware of government leaders who have an agenda, who is on a socialist agenda to lead us away from the things that have made us great and the things that will make us weak. Things away from God and things that will cause us to believe that our strength our victories, and our future is simply in the men and women who are political leaders of this nation. And I submit to you today on the authority of God that that, 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 that is a very, very dangerous philosophy that can destroy this nation in the coming years. We as free men must stand together today. Whether our sons, grandsons, or great-grandsons will stand as free men greatly depends upon you and upon me. If America remains free, it will depend on our attitude toward and our commitment to the preservation of freedom. 
In the years past, men and women pledged their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor in another cause for freedom. I wonder today, as I look at the news and as I read the articles and as I see what's happening in America, I wonder actually how many of us in the United States today would pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor for the good of others. Not for the advancement of self, but for the good of all, for the sake of a whole, for the birth and for the advancement of our nation. It was that kind of spirit that prompted Nathan Hale to speak the, his immortal words, I only regret that I have one life to lose for my country. Hale was not in a worship service when he said that. It was not a time of national peace and worldwide tranquility. But it was on the occasion when Nathan Hale was about to be hung as a spy. Our enemies at that time had convicted him, and he was giving his life for your sake and for mine. The thrilling episode of Paul Revere, Paul Revere at Concord and the Old North Church is a saga of resistance to tyranny. A few years ago, Lynn and I had the privilege to cross the bridge over the Charles River and to look at the steeple of the Old North Church as our minds were carried back in history. I am profoundly impressed with what has taken place in our history and the sacrifice that has been made for us. It's certainly true that at Lexington a shot was fired which was heard around the world. To think that tyranny has decisively and forever been defeated at the end of the Revolutionary War is to misunderstand its insidiousness and to misread history and what's going on in present-day America. Like a beard, tyranny returns daily and must be fought continually. Our Lord faced the temptations of Satan in concentrated form in the wilderness. But that did not, did not exalt the temptations or the efforts of Satan to lure our Lord into sin. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, who was but in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Jesus Christ had a daily battle with Satan, just as you and I have a daily battle with Satan. The same thing is true regarding tyranny. The same fight against tyranny is continuous. No generation will ever be exempt from the struggle because human nature is what it is. Until human nature in general and in totality is transformed by the power of God and because what God designed it to be, the fight against tyranny must continue. I believe a vast majority of Americans remember the Maine, the Alamo, the Argonne Forest, and Pearl Harbor when those who cause for freedom come in our generations and generations to come, America answered in the past, they stayed still, and it's over, and it's over. They will stay until it's over again. We must have Americans that are willing to stay until we come home bearing our flag and walking with pride and living in freedom. 
This includes those who we can look back on in Flanders Field, the Rock of Caragorda, the bleak slopes of Korea, and the steaming venom-infested jungles of Vietnam, and the desert storms, and the Iraq, and the Irans. Americans have stood when the time came for free men to stand. Whether or not they continue will depend upon us. I draw your attention to the national anthem that was sung so gracefully by these two young ladies who bless my heart almost every Sunday. Not just with their singing, but with their lives and with their, person their personality. And it goes something like this. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us as a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause is just and be our motto, God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why America is here today. In every generation, free men have dared to stand, to put their lives on the line for values more important in the long-range perspective than those immediate values to which we often simply respond to out of our desperate need. I don't believe that old-fashioned American patriotism is dead. I still believe that Americans would and will respond instantaneously to any aggressive act of tyranny against us. Free men must stand not only against tyranny, but we must stand against tragedy. You see, I'm not one of those people who believes that love is blind. I believe just the opposite. For God is love and God is not blind to my sin nor to my need. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No, love is not blind. Love elevates. Love knows. Love sees faults and fumbles and frailties and, fra and failures. His love for me is never at stake. For an example, in our families, we debate about the food budget. We bicker over the discipline of our children. We disagree about the din in the fender of our new car. But our love for one another is not at stake. In that spirit, I want to simply take the time to point out some tragedies that I feel exist in our society that absolutely must be dealt with. Perhaps the greatest tragedy is our indifference. It is no new thought to be reminded that the words U.S. stands for us. Not just United States, it stands for us. No nation will ever rise above its people. And I submit to you today that you and I are this nation. No nation will be stronger than its weakest link. And we are links in the chain. Frankly, I'm convinced that self-interest has become the God of our lives, both in society and in the work 
of the kingdom of God. This is not only true in regard to the church and to the kingdom of God, but it is also in, true in regard to our nation. We oppose anything that runs counter to our personal likes and dislikes. If it affects us adversity, we immediately arise in indignation to oppose it. If, if we're not concerned for the good of the whole, we're concerned about what affects us primarily. I wonder how long this nation can exist with that kind of spirit until we as a people become big enough to get interested in the good of the corporate body, we may be assured that we are on a tobogging slide downward toward destruction. That is exactly what Isaiah said to the people of his day in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. I wonder if that could very well be said of our generation. We're looking out for number one. And if we don't like something, we simply oppose it. We are against it. If it causes change in our schedule or our routine, we won't have anything to do with it. Self-interest is a tragedy in regard to national interest. I'm convinced that another tragedy is non-involvement. Our indifference has led to our non-involvement, and it's eating away at the heart of America like a cancer. One of the wonders of the world is the Great Wall of China, which extends for more than 2,000 miles along the border between Mongolia and the nation of China. It was built in the 3rd century B.C. by an emperor who utilized 300,000 workers most of whom were prisoners. The wall was 50 feet high, and it was between 15 and 25 feet thick in areas. It had towers at regular intervals. The interesting thing about the Great Wall of China is that the wall was never bridged in combat by any enemy. <clears throat> they didn't have to. The enemy simply bribed the gatekeepers, and they came through without having to use any force on any entrance. That is a natural result of indifference and non-involvement. It is failure to stand in the gap when a battle is taking place. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I cannot, and we must not, and we by God's grace cannot stand by and do nothing and say nothing as we see future looming in front of us. I want to make one last statement, and this is it. When free men stand tall, we bend our knees before Almighty God. A nation never stands taller or more erectly than when it bends its knee before its maker. That's the reason America has been great. And unless that reason prevails again, America's greatness is in the past and not in the future. During the dark days of World War II, Winston Churchill was invited to return to Hara, the preparatory school which he attended as a boy. The headmaster reminded all of the students to be sure to bring their pencils and their notebooks to, to record the words 
of this great and famous statesman. When Winston Churchill, that gallant warrior, stood, he said, Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. And he turned and was seated. Someone has said, America is a mess. I've said it. I've said it this week. And you've said it. And you've probably said it this week. We look at the news. We listen to the politicians. We listen at the bickering. We listen to the name calling. We look at the indifference and the non involvement in Washington, D.C. And we often wonder do these people remember why they were elected? And we say, America is in a mess. And that may be true. But I submit to you, it's my mess, and I love her. It's your mess. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. It's our mess. But to restore faith, family, and freedom in America, we need God's Spirit to transform our individual's lives. I tell you again, as I've said so often before, this is not a time for the church of the living God to cower down in our face of opposition. It is time for us to stand on the doorsteps from Raleigh to Washington and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. I know today has been different from the times that I've stood in this pulpit and preached to you. But I want you to understand, I don't believe that I've ever preached a message or shared a truth that is any more important than the message that I've shared with you on this day, July the 3rd, 2016. We must, we must, by God's grace, stand and be what God has called us to be. We must, first of all, be His representatives. But we must also be Americans. We must stand and we must be brave and we must speak out. And by all means, we must have the courage to go to the polls and vote this year. Vote your convictions. Whoever you vote for, vote and make your voice count. We cannot, we must not, and by God's grace, we must not be silent any longer. Pardon the expression, but I have heard and heard and heard again that the church is the sleeping political giant that it makes me want to puke. I am tired of our indifference. I am tired of our non-involvement. And I challenge you 
No, no, no. I plead with you. Please. Stand up and be counted for the glory of God and for the future of our nation. Let's stand together. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sins, I encourage you to do so today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you'll make this your prayer, I want you to lift your hands up, get them up, say it out loud with me, Father, give me the courage to represent you on this earth as we face the future. Give me the courage to live my faith, to proclaim my faith, and to trust in you. I can, not because of Washington. Not because of Raleigh, but because I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. In Jesus' name, amen. Whatever God's put on your heart, I want you to step out from where you are. Make your way to the front. If God is speaking to you about church membership, I want you to come. If God's speaking to you about being saved, I want you to come. Whatever God's put on your heart. I want you to very quickly stay, step out from where you are and make your way to the front. You come right now.